Well, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you found your way satisfactorily to the sandwiches. Um, now, we move on to this afternoon, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Jacqueline de Cholet, who actually has really, we're very, I'm very pleased she's here. She's actually due to be in Delhi from Switzerland and just changed her flights around uh, to be with us today, which is jolly nice of her. She founded the VME Project for Reproductive Health and Education for Women in Rajasthan in India. And the aim of this was to create self-sufficiency for village women and girls and to empower them to take control of their own lives. And over the past 40 years, she's been active in these areas, women's social justice and education and public housing, including working in that rather grim area, London's East End. She's also been involved with similar uh, rights of women and their education in Africa and with refugees in, in New York. Uh, Jacqueline, Thank you very much for coming along today to talk to us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me, an honor too, to talk about an issue that I care so much about, which is young women in the developing world and who we should have the same opportunities as you all have in our societies. I based it a lot on what Eleanor Roosevelt said a very long time ago that there was no social transformation in a country without the participation of women. But how can they participate in the life of their communities, of their countries, if they remain illiterate? A village woman in India once said to me, how can I take a bus if I can't read the sign of where it's going? In a way, so I would like to tell you the story of a small project in Rajasthan in a very deprived part of the desert about how change can take place and how you can empower women, young women, to take control of their lives. It's a very used word, empowerment, and I only define it in one way. It is the capacity to make your own life choices, whether to work, whether when to get married, whether to have children, what to do. And this is denied in many ways to a lot of young women. So I will tell you the story of Vienna through um, photographs and some text. Um, the Vienna project was started in 1993. It was originally a health, more health oriented about women's health and adolescent girls. And then it evolved into education because as I said, you change nothing if you don't educate women. So these are just global indicators for you. According to UNESCO, there's still 119 mil million women are out of school. And the education goes beyond schooling. The other important thing is that school is a safe place for girls. Often, they're not that safe in their environment, but in school, they're safe. So it allows them to make decisions about their own lives. So this is the Vienna Project, and girls go to school. They live in an institute but they go to school, they can, in this institute, they're taken care of their health, they're safe, they do lots of activities, which you will see, but they attend good schools. So in, why India? Because the gender gap in India, out of 156 countries, it's rank, ranks, ranks very low in gender equality, and particularly in women's participation. So look at the last figure. If you raised women's participation at the same level as men, you would boost India's GDP by 27%. So it's a waste of women's lives, of the energy they can contribute to their country. So Rajasthan is one of the worst performing states in India. Very backward, the overall literacy is only 69%, but 57% um, of women are literate. And it has a population of 78 million, but there were 2 million, 4.7 million missing women. I don't know if you know that, but because of gender selection in India, there are 50 million women missing, which is a violence against women. 
that is not talked enough about. So the prevalence of child marriage is very high, particularly in the rural areas where Vianney operates, where it's practically 90%. All girls are married or are promised in marriage. So this is a story of child brides. That those two girls were child brides. They come from a village of Dalits, which we have a strong presence in. And Dorga was the subject of a movie made by some people in Singapore, has been showed quite widely. Those two, this village decided about three years ago that they would never marry another girl in their village. So this tradition of child marriage, we can't change it as foreigners. It has to come from the community and the community has to make those decisions. And when a village like that makes a decision, it was a big village event to tell us that, it, that's why you make change. We can't impose it, it has to come from them. So this the justification what happens to girls if they don't go to school? You can read of the, the less decision-making, early marriage, early childbearing, of course, and it's got a negative impact on her health. She has too many children, too close to each other. And the other thing is that the job opportunity, if she's not educated, there are no job opportunities. So it also, we know, has a negative impact on a child's health, on their children. So Everything you know, that goes into each other in the sense of an uneducated woman will not have as much um, chance, no, no chance in life. There's, as I said, no tra social transformation without the education of women. Viennese has a holistic approach to girls' education. So what does that consist of? The safe accommodation, access to good education facilities, and comprehensive health care. Most girls, when they arrive age 12, as you know, secondary schooling in India is 6 to 12, age 12 to 18, are anemic, underweight. And this is the first thing we do is to get their health right. They board, they have very good food. Food is very important. They have a lot of extracurricular activities. Importantly, we'll talk about the computer literacy, which is something innovative that we started in 2017 that allowed the whole coronavirus time for the girls not to drop out of school because they had tablets, they were distance learning, not one girl dropped out of school. They have conversational English and they have career counseling and guidance. So this is the girls, there are 110 girls in this institute, as I said, aged from 12 to 18, and all of them go on to college education. The main, well also, we do a variety of activities as you would all have, they have, they have um, excursions, they visit um, theme parks, this was a particular one they loved, which was a theme park, also, they do sports. Now, self-defense is something that was introduced and they are incredibly good at it. They can break bricks with their arms. I uh, defy anybody to attack one of those girls. Uh, they are tough and they love it. Um, so this is the theory of change, how you can make the interventions, how you can enroll disadvantaged girls and provide a safe supportive. I'd like to say that it's mixed caste. We never look at caste. We never discuss caste, uh, which in India is, as you know, quite a subject. Um, a father came to me about high caste girls, Dalits, all kinds of caste. The father came to me last time I was there and said his daughter, high caste girl, had become friends with a Dalit. And he wanted us to break that friendship up. And I said, I'm sorry, we believe in friendship and we never interfere. And if you're not happy with your daughter being there, you can always take her out. So two weeks later, he came back with two chocolates. And he said, I bought two chocolates. And I said, well, we have 110 girls. And he said, I'm a poor man. I brought chocolates for my daughter and her friend. He had changed his mind. It was very touching that this can happen because the caste environment is a complicated one. So the other thing is, we provide opportunities for self-expression. So a lot of it is they do theater, they write plays, they act them out. They 
Indian teaching is very rote. It's a tough curriculum, very tough, and it's very much about rote learning. And um, creativity is not very strong in their program. So we try to bring creativity through plays, through self-expression. There are girls who arrive age 12 who currently like, will not lift their heads up. Within a year, they are able to talk in front of 100 people. So self-confidence is very much part of this program. So the education is very good. They go to very good private schools. They have tutors. Um, now the computer lab, in 2017, we got a grant for computer lab and the girls are computer literate, which is rare because they don't even teach it in some of the schools. And this has been, and, and we also have ICT technology, which meant that when they couldn't go to school with, within a big screen, we could have in tutoring in the institute from teachers outside. So these are all, technology is, as you know, incredibly important. And technology has helped us keep all these girls in education, but also they're ahead of the game because they're computer literate. So again, I said the outcomes is seven years of secondary education, the health pro um, prospects, also um, career guidance for the future. So the, the, the impact is this successful uh, transition to adulthood and giving them some choices in life of careers. Now, I don't know if you know that, but in, in India, 50% of government jobs go to low cost, but because they're not educated enough, they, they, those jobs are rarely filled, which are teachers, nurses, or government employees. So increasingly, the girls are going into those careers. Uh, so here are the computer lessons, the distance learning, as you can see, they have, there are lots of computers, and the fact that they're computer literate is a huge advantage for them. So what are the ac academic achievements? As I told you, 100% are retained in the program. They move to the next class and they earn that secondary education certificate, some of them with very high marks. Uh, the, the health outcomes is they have 100% immunized. Um, they achieve normal body and um, BI for their ages. And 90% are not anemic because anemia, anemia remains a big pro problem in, in India. So, uh, as I mentioned, they pursue higher education, nurses, doctors, police officers, government, employment, teachers, and other professions. Now, I just want to tell you quickly the story. It's a short video. Shoba is, was a child bride. She came from a pretty terrible village on the highway, which was a liquor trafficking, where all the girls were child brides. And she... I'll let her tell her story. She tells it. So, uh, how do I do that? I don't know. Namaste. Hello, everybody. Myself, Shobha, from village Rajwa. I don't know how to speak good English, but I will try to say about myself. When I was nine year old, my parents was fixed my marriage with a boy of my near village in 1998. Since 2007 to 2000. 12. I was a student of the Vini Institute. In these five years, I have completed my higher, higher schooling and graduation. In 2012, my parents sent me to my husband's house. When I showed him first time, I was shocked because he was drinked and very abusing me. I got depressed and crying. For five days, his behavior was same as first day. I tried to convince my parents and my in-laws, but no one was there to hear me about this mishappening. After this all, I went to near police station and reported all this story. Police called my parents, but they forced me to remain there, but I don't want to go there again. I went high court and case my file. My case completed in one year. And after that, finally, I got divorced. In between that time, I completed my bachelor's of education degree. It's calling beard, it's the teacher training. Now I am doing master of arts final year in history with doing part-time work also. Now I am feeling happy 
and free from all foundation of child marriage. I really thanks to Vini Project who gave me an opportunity to grow up myself as a single woman. If I went, if I, if I were in the husband house, it's sure that I had killed myself due to this situation. Once again, thanks to Virni and all who supported me. Thanking you. Now, I'll tell you the story. She was, her story was written up in National Geographic by a journalist from the, and it was, as you know, National Geographic is read in so many languages. And Cynthia Gurney uh, paid for her college education. Um, it was after her college education that she had this terrible experience. In her words to me, she said, I was treated like an animal. But she got out of it. And she went to, we helped her go to Jaipur. Her life was in danger in Jodhpur. And she went to Jaipur. She got herself, you know, paid, worked and did some jobs. And eventually she joined the police force. Now, this is her today. She's now a high ranking officer in the police. And she's on her way to a great career. She has two women working for her. So India needs more young women like her. I mean, she's a champion, really, because what she went through is, we cannot imagine how difficult her life was. But now she's, she's amazing. She's wonderful. I will be seeing her next week. So those are the objectives of the project. And we've talked about it to complete secondary education, to improve their knowledge and decision-making ability, to expose them to a world outside of the village, and to develop their sense of agency, right self-confidence, self-expression, leadership, and friends. So a few years ago, uh, we asked them, we did a literary competition and it, the team was friendship, which was actually set by my granddaughter, who was a, a volunteer at the program. And they wrote the most wonderful play, which my grandchildren acted, about the importance of friendship. Friendship is difficult in villages. So the other thing is they have health checkups. We have a doctor. Uh, they're weighed regularly, uh, measured. Uh, their whole health is taken into account. That's important. Their diet is important as well. They do homework. Their homework, we have tutors to help them when they need it. And uh, there I am about the friendship part, because in villages, it's hard for them. They're always told to work, to fetch water, to do things. I remember once in a village, I said to a young man, to a young boy, and they said, why do you make girls take go and fetch water. Why aren't you fetching water? And he said, oh, that's a girl's job. That's not man's job. And I said, okay, then you don't take a bath. Then you don't drink water. You know, this is kind of how changing mindsets. It's, um, so it's, it's really, so we're talking about girl power. These girls really love it. They love, they celebrate it. They are, um, this is them walking around the Institute. And this is a traditional welcome. If you come and visit, that's what uh, takes place. And they love the Rangoli. You know, they paint their hands. They love doing that. And that's the Vianney family. That's with all the staff. They have matrons. They have nurses. They have um, teachers and tutors. So in all, this is it's a family. It's really how it functions as a family. So thank you from the Viennese girls. They would love to hear from you. So what does Viennese mean? It means the hero woman. Via means hero in Hindi, and Ni means woman. So it's the program. It's 110 girls. We refused 450 last year. It's a drop in the ocean, but as we say, the ocean is made of drops. So we need all of you. So I just want to finish by saying that in the audience today is um, a great friend of mine, a young friend of mine called Sita Shoot, who was my second ever volunteer at Vienna. She went there in 2004 and she taught in the villages. So her experience is an invaluable one. So I'm going to ask her 
to come and say a few words. She has started a junior ambassador club in London. And she's, as I mentioned, a member of our foundation. So uh, Sita, will you come and say a few words? So, um, meanwhile, yeah, we started a young ambassadors club because we thought that we need a break for younger women, especially, sort of fight for the rights of their counterparts in our in the world where they need to be more So, I'm really happy and want to contact me about that and volunteering in general and you know, all, all, all to get involved with, with just spreading the message that other people are to come. So I, I'll just send my next to the one. I don't know. How do you find how do you find these things out? The, the links. Oh, okay. Well but if you if you send it <clears throat> send it to me okay. and I can send that on. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Sita. Now please I'll open it to question. Anybody has a question, please ask me. Good. Jacqueline, thank you. <clears throat> please. How does it help? All right, um, two several answers. One is there is a minimum income to for girls to be able to attend. A, they have to be from rural rural areas. They cannot come from a city where there's the, the Tar Desert is a very poor region with tiny little hamlets and so on. So it's basically practically under $2 a day of families of hardship. Um, because the Viennese project operated for 10 years in villages, we have strong, they have strong contacts in the villages. We, they had what we call promoters, women who were our representatives who organized originally the activities of the project, which were health, education, because the, the institute only started in 2005 as a residential. So the, the key to the project is the confidence of the, the, the over years of the villagers towards the project. But also, and the, the criteria for coming to the project is that the girls do have to have the capacity to follow a good school. If they don't, we'll tutor them. Um, that they, we do special cases for girls who are vulnerable, who've lost their mothers, or, you know, there's a lot of hardship in those villages. But the criteria is really rural based and very low, the lowest income, the among the poorest. Uh, most of their families are illiterate. Um, they're probably the first person to be literate. Um, and it's how you get out of poverty, how you 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 got, you managed to understand the value of education. Now, there's an interesting change, which is recent, uh, I would say in the last year or so, is that before it was mothers who wanted their daughters educated. Now it's fathers. Before the fathers stayed outside, they didn't even bother to come and talk to us. Now his fathers were coming, a new generation, younger generation of men in India who want their daughters educated. And this is a quantum leap. This is an incredible development. So this is how you affect change in time. You don't impose it. You listen. You go to the villages. You listen. And you 
you see what they, how they are changing their mindset. So I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> any, <clears throat> any other, any, any other questions? No? And I think this makes us realize just how lucky, how lucky we are here, whatever we may decide we want to moan about. Um, it also, to me, really makes the point that if you want to have change, it's bottom up, not top down. Um, and if any of you <clears throat> are thinking of doing anything in your gap year, this is the sort of thing to do. Of my various and many children, three of them couldn't escape and two taught in India and one in Africa. They won't like me saying it. It made a difference. I could see that. Um, <clears throat> good. Jacqueline, thank you very much indeed. Well, Adrian, I want to thank you for giving me this chance to talk about this project, which is, you know, so close to my heart. And uh, for these young, wonderful young women, I'd like to say that I've also funded projects in Africa, also for education. And it is the only way to change the world and these girls should have the same rights as you have so it needs all your help it needs all your input to ensure that your sisters it's a sisterhood your sisters in the developing world have what you have so thank you for listening